Dear students, in the second lecture about viruses, especially when, as it pertains to environmental and public health, we will be talking about uh, first viral evolution and how virus played role in evolution of uh, DNA based life and then we will be talking mostly about pathogenic viruses because that is very important for public health. And here I would like to mention to you that um, when we will be talking about wastewater treatment and when we will be talking about water treatment, I will briefly go over waterborne viruses and I will go over bacteriophage. So, we will cover the environmental health later, but for today our focus would be mostly on public health and we will be as I mentioned in the previous lecture, we will also be talking about viroids and briefly about prions. So, let us get started. One of the most um, promising evolutionary theories that has been uh, uh, proposed recently and then good evidence has been gathered in its favor is that life started with RNA basis. So, uh, earlier we did not have this additional step of DNA that required to be transcribed into RNA, but there was just RNA present and then proteins were translated from RNA and um, life continued right. So, a, all the protoviruses are believed to be RNA based viruses, even the initial cells bacterial cells or archaeal cells they are assumed or uh, believed to be RNA based life forms. Now, dear students if you have attended the previous lectures really well, you must know that RNA is not a very stable genetic element. Uh, it, has, it is quite short lived in fact, some RNA messenger RNAs have half life of few minutes and some of them up to few hours, but DNA can last really long. So, we note here that our initial life was RNA based, so they did not have to spend a lot of energy in the transcription process and could make proteins directly. However, uh, it is now proposed that the, it was the RNA based viruses that eventually uh, um, developed DNA specific enzymes that allowed them to become DNA virus. So, initially they were it is hypothesized with some evidence that initially they were RNA virus and then these DNA based enzymes allowed them to become DNA viruses, but with the uracil. So, they still held, the, held on to the uracil that is typical of RNA, but that was still DNA based virus and then they got rid of uracil and had thymine which was more stable. So, then they became DNA based viruses with thymine in it. Now, when these DNA based viruses they infected other cells. So, remember they can undergo two processes, they can undergo lytic process, uh, pathway where they replicate inside the cell, they make proteins and more genetic material and then they break off, they lyse the cell membrane and they are free now to go and infect other host cells. In the lysogenic pathway they become integral part of the cellular chromosome and they replicate usually and they just remain silent until they move back to the lytic pathway. But so, it is believed that when these DNA viruses they infected the cells and they underwent the lysogenic pathway not the lytic pathway, the cells discovered that some part of their genetic material was very stable. So, the RNA based genetic material would degrade really fast, but then this viral genetic material the DNA based viral genetic material would last longer and thus the infection of an RNA cell by a DNA virus could have exposed the cells to the more stable chemistry of DNA over RNA. Now, when um, the ancestors of bacteria or the protobacteria they are they were probably infected by a very different kind of viral DNA than the ones that um, ancestors of archaea and eukarya were infected and that is why we see that the bacterial mechanisms and metabolism is at times very different than archaea and eukarya. So, archaea and eukarya are very close to each other in some cellular functions. So, maybe it is just that the prototype of bacteria was infected by different DNA based viruses and thus their cellular function and machinery is somewhat different. Alrighty, so now let us uh, now that I have cleared this up about the latest theory in evolution of uh, virus, let us move on to tumor virus. We briefly talked about them in the previous class, but let us take a good look at tumor viruses. So, what I am going to show you is actually a virus called polyoma virus and this induces tumor in human beings. So, this is polyoma virus and let us look at how polyoma viruses enters a cell and causes the cell machinery to convert into tumor cells. So, you have this polyoma virus which is circular DNA based virus. So, this is tumor virus 
which is DNA base and once it is injected into the cell what it does is it undergoes lysogenic pathway not the lytic pathway. So basically if the green is a host cell it will integrate itself into the host DNA. So now that it is integrated into host DNA whenever this portion of the DNA of the um, host cell would be transcribed it will make mRNA for the entire portion. So, because you know this will have its own start codon and stop codon and ribosome binding site and all those things, it will make an mRNA which will be a tumor virus mRNA. So, what was a DNA, a potential for making um, certain proteins, a potential for causing certain uh, activity in the cell now becomes a message, a mRNA. Now, this mRNA if the cell is healthy and working fine and does not identify this to be a foreign uh, genetic material, then it will translate it into, it will translate it into proteins that will convert a healthy cell into tumor cell. So basically a healthy animal cell can be converted into tumor cell by a lysogenic pathway by tumor viruses such as polyoma virus. Now there are certain viruses like in the previous lecture I talked about retroviruses, these are single stranded RNA viruses. So it does not have to undergo, uh, it does not have to be a tumor virus based DNA but it can be single stranded RNA virus too and it might also cause us tumor. Okay, I, I talked briefly about retrovirus, you know, coming to retrovirus replication. So remember retroviruses are the viruses that, are, that have uh, single stranded RNA in them. And in the previous lecture I talked about well, how retroviruses survive in the cell and how they replicate themselves. So let us go into a little bit more detail about uh, retrovirus replication using reverse transcriptase. So basically in the viral RNA there are uh, at the end there are direct repeats and then reverse transcription happens and um, it starts from the 5 prime end and then there is this uh, primer tRNA here. So the terminally redundant viron RNA is uh, removed by the reverse transcriptase ribonuclease H activity and then it is transferred to the 3 prime end and then similarly here on this end it will start uh, trans um, it will start here. No, it will start reverse transcribing this end from 3 prime to 5 prime. So initially it started from 5 prime to 3 prime some 100 base pair and he here it has a terminal redundant terminal which is removed. So once it is separated it sticks here because remember these are direct repeats. So once you have a reverse uh, a cDNA a complemented DNA of this it will be complemented to this also right. So it will come here and it will stick here and then the reverse transcription will go from this end to this end. So once it has been reverse transcribed from this end to this end, then it will remove all the unnecessary portion of the genetic material for example this one and then it will complete its DNA and then it will become part of the other DNA, it will integrate with it and once it has integrated with the host chromosomal DNA, now it is in a provirus state. So now it will just wait for this part of the DNA to become, to be transcribed and once it is transcribed it will have its mRNA and then the mRNA will make the proteins required to make the viron. Okay. As promised, let us talk about viroids. So um, viroids as I mentioned earlier, these are single stranded RNA but they differ from retrovirus in the sense that they do not have anything else. So basically it is just single stranded RNA that is moving from one host cell to another host cell and infecting them in, re in return. Now the obvious question you, you must ask is if it is only single stranded RNA, how is it stable? How does it survive the environment? So as I mentioned earlier that RNA have short lives and single stranded RNA will have shorter life than double stranded RNA, single stranded DNA will have shorter life than double stranded RNA and both DNA and RNA in the external environment such as the air, water, fomite, they do not last very long that is why they need the capsid, capsomeres, uh, the, the protein coat to allow them to survive in the harsh environment because in the cell it is humid, it is wet and it is just the perfect environment for them to thrive, to undergo metabolic processes but once they are out in the environment they have to live like a particle devoid of all necessary ingredients for life. So how does a single stranded RNA survive? Well, it so happens that viroids, people are studying them in plants and we notice that they do not survive out in the environment, they just transfer from one cell to the neighboring cell, to the neighboring cell, to the neighboring cell. So the infection spreads cell by cell and it is slower than if it were airborne but you know in plants by the time the infection is apparent it is quite bad. Okay. Now it is single standard but does not mean that it 
all the nucleotides are exposed and waiting for anything to come and make hydrogen bonds with its AGTC. What it does is it has a conserved central domain. So within your single stranded RNA there will be conserved domains which are complementary to each other. So they fold in a way so that the conserved domain uh, are complementary. So it, it looks something like this. So here I have possible viroid. So in this viroid particle there is a central conserved domain and you see CC, CC, GG, perfect complement of GG, G, CC. Now notice this is CG rich, it is rich in cytosine and guanine and if you remember from the first few classes cytosine and guanine have triple bonds between them so they are strong bonds. So this uh, they create very good reason for this uh, viroid to stay in this uh, overlapped form. So when it makes the overlap formed we have uh, the conserved central domain which makes sure that none of the nucleotides susceptible to anything coming and making hydrogen bonds with it and destroying the integrity of the viroid. So this is the job of conserved central domain and then we have the variable domain which varies from one viroid to another, one type of viroid to another, then you have the RH terminal, you have the right hand terminal and the left hand terminal and then you have a typical pathogenic domain which encodes for proteins that call make it pathogenic. Okay. So let us see how it works in the cell. First it will, now let us say if this is a plant and it is a healthy plant but I inoculate it with a, a particular viroid and when I have inoculated it with the viroid what will do first step is it will replicate in the inoculated leaf and go from cell to cell. So it is as I mentioned from one cell to another never exposing itself to the environment because the environment is hostile outside the cell but within the cell if it just moves from one cell to cell it will be fine. So note here um, these viroids, these folded single stranded RNA it will move from one cell to another and in each time it makes multiple copies. So each time it makes multiple copies, three copies and then more copies and they keep moving. The second is that when the, it leaves the cell, uh, leaf and it enters the phloem vasculature, so now it can move through the vascular system of the plants and then once it is moved through the, uh, so this is the bundle sheet and here you have vascular parenchyma and then it goes to the companion cells and now once it has gone to companion cells it can go to the sieve element and then it can move on to, so once it has gone to sieve element it can move very easily. So these cells are longer and they are very good for transportation and then um, here look they can go and infect other leaf. So they can have they can have from one leaf the infection is spread to other leaf. Now the beauty to note here is that this is plasmodesmata and this arrow is showing you the viral replication. So virus is making more viral copy one made three and then more and then more and then more at every step. So it is replicating everywhere except in the sieve element. And, um, and this is long distance movement, these are short distance movement but this is very nice and important to know how viroid moves from one cell to cell until the entire tree is destroyed and a tree or a plant has a lot of plant cells and never exposes itself to the environment. Okay. Now look what, what are the damages that viroid can do, if you look very carefully in this picture, these are your healthy potatoes. And these are potatoes infected by this viroid, these are potatoes infected by these viroid, grown under otherwise very similar conditions and you notice how they can affect our agricultural productivity. So this is not just a plant disease problem but it becomes very soon an economic problem and then a social problem and then a public health problem because when people do not have food to eat then we have they are susceptible to other diseases. Similarly if you look at these tomato plants, this is the control and then this has mild infection intermediate infection and very severe infection. So it might cause a blight of uh, um, a, a magnitude that um, we can only fear. A healthy apple, apple infected by um, viroid and even the plants, it is not just the size of the plants or the color of the fruits or the quality of the fruits and vegetables that diminishes but also the, the morphology of the plant changes, the color of the plant changes. Okay, so this is a very nice study that was recently published about viroids and they actually would now be using our, uh, our tools, you can actually sequence the viroid and look here, not only did they sequence the viroid but they could also see how the viroid SSRNA, single stranded RNA folds onto itself and uh, in the GC rich regions, complementary GC rich regions. So if you look here, they are perfect complement here, so all the perfect complements are in black and the others are in red. So you have domains that are loop, they are not very um, 
they are not complementary to each other. So, this tail is blue, but then you have lot of complementary region and more they, it is very G series region if you go through them very nicely and look and they identified the pathogenic zones or in this region which zones are pathogenic and they also uh, ex notice that when we change when we cause changes in these pathogenic zones the health of the plant changes decreases or increases very good study and this is an example for you on how you can become future researcher and look after our plant health our agriculture output the health of even um, trees so that our forests and our greenery is maintained well and look here you have, you must be familiar with sequencing techniques by now the ones that i talked earlier so the sequences not only tell us what, who is present in terms of taxonomy they not only tell us what it is doing which we get when we do functional annotation of our uh, sequences but they can also help us understand the molecular biological background of a phenomena for example we know that okay this is a viroid it causes diseases in our tomato plants but we do not know what part of it are pathogenic, what elements in this viroid are pathogenic. We do not know the structure of the pathogen of this viroid. We do not know because if we know the structure, we know the loops that are pathogenic, we can tackle them. We can make drugs that will interfere with these loops particularly and then they will al not allow these viroids to affect the, uh, because they are single stranded RNA, so they will not allow them to translate and thus affect the health of the plant. So, in this particular study they use the sequencing techniques and then they use some in silica modeling in silica tools that allowed them to fold the single stranded rna so that the perfect complements met each other and look how beautifully it starts from here from one it's a 360 some base pair long viroid and then it folds here perfectly in near 180 and then it comes and it complements so it's a very very it's a fantastically uh, smart approach of protecting and still being single standard RNA. So the beauty of single standard RNA is that you get directly translated, you don't have to waste the plant resources to undergo the transcription process, you don't have to become integrated into the host DNA and then wait for DNA to translate, transcribe your part of the um, genome. Alrighty, so now we move on to prion. So we talked about virus, we talked about viroid and now let's talk about prion. Okay, so on one extreme we have pathogenic bacteria, these are fully functional viable bacterial cells that can infect animals, it can infect animals such as us and cause diseases in us. Then we talked about viruses which are neither alive nor dead but somewhere in there depending on the context if they are inside the host they can replicate so they might be alive but if they are outside then they are not alive. But um, and now we are moving on and viruses you know they do not have functional proteins, they only have protein coats that keep them safe in the external environment. Then we talked about viroids which are devoid of everything except single standard RNA and viroids are the smallest pathogens at times so 600 if you look here again just uh, 360 nucleotides, 360 base pairs that is tiny, tiniest pathogens. But now prions are in very interesting that they do not have any genetic material, they are just proteins, just proteins that are naturally and the beauty why they do not need any genetic material is because the proteins are net, the gene for the protein is already found inside the animal, typically in the neurons, typically inside the brain. This is the reason why we have mad cow disease and the prime disease that eats up the brain of human beings also. So, this is a picture of how a prine infested brain would look. Okay, so how does prion work? Let us look here. So as I mentioned the eukaryotic cells especially the uh, nuclear cells and you can tell this is nuclear cells because you have axons extending out here. So these are the tails of your um, neurons and they already in the nucleus, this is nucleus, they already have a gene called PRNP gene. Okay, so the PRNP gene makes the PRPC protein. So, PRNP gene is prion protein gene, prion protein gene. It makes PRPC protein which is a normal prion protein and it does its job, there is nothing wrong in it. But if it undergoes a misfolding, it gets misfolded, then this PRPC becomes PRPSC and this misfolded protein has abnormal function. Okay, now we have PF, PRPC here, so this is healthy protein, it undergoes nucleation, it becomes a misfolded protein PRPSC 
and now what it can do is it makes other uh, prion proteins undergo elongation conformational change make more prion breaks in and so these so these proteins now become like this and they stack onto each other and then it breaks and makes new seeds so okay a misfolded protein big deal but no this misfolded uh, protein then starts damaging the brain cells and starts uh, causing really bad disease now this is called a pathogen even though it is and it seems like misfolding protein problem because the misfolded protein now activates and makes other well folded proteins into misfolded proteins so if you remember in the last lecture when i was talking about classifying things into living and non living beings living beings the criteria that most scientists agree on is that they can replicate so which a cell can replicate it's alive a virus can replicate inside a host okay may be alive may not be alive a protein can activate on its own now we are talking about pathogens even though it's not alive because it can't survive on its own it's not it does not even have a genetic material but it causes other uh, prion proteins to become sick misfolded proteins so in this sense it is uh, replicable and it is alive now prion disease is a major disease in dairy industry and it causes the mad cow disease it is also it also affects human beings though it's not very common for human beings but very common for dairy now there was a study recently that saw how um, consumption of meat affected by prion can uh, be a source of infection so what they did was they took different animals that were affected by prion and they fed the meat of that animal to fishes and they noticed when they fed it from the sheep there was no pk resistant deposition but when they fed it from bovine that were infected by prion they noticed changes happening in their brain same thing from scrapy the mouse they noticed that the brain spleen intestine all of them had issues now you must have noticed that the misfolded protein is called PRPSC and the reason is because the normal protein PRPC when it was misfolded it was first detected in the scrapy mouse so here SC stands for scrapy so prion protein in scrapy the messed up protein okay so after doing this study where they saw they fed prion infected uh, animals meat to different animals and saw where the in, um, infection undergoes so look here in the last one they had they fed the mouse scrapy prion infected scrapies meat to fish and then the different parts of fish were fed to the um, mouse like healthy mouse again and they noticed that the misfolded prion protein was found in the brain whether the mouse ate brain parts spleen part or intestine part so um, to the prion can no no here no this is another uh, evidence that suggests that prion is actually a pathogen not just a case of misfolded protein because not only can it replicate within the cell but it can go from one sick animal to another so if you go back to one of the first things i taught was coach postulates on identifying a pathogen and two main criteria was it should be able to replicate it should be able to be isolated from a sick animal and then it should be able to be maintained or grown in the lab and then it should be able to infect healthy animals and this is exactly what they observed so prion is definitely a pathogen so when they were done with their study they have this uh, tentative proposed um cycle of how prion can transfer well you have mad cow mad cow is in cow infected by prion and fish is eat it it's fish so if fish is infected cow can get infected if cow is infected it's um, some body parts are used for making fish meals the fish can get infected humans might consume fish parts such as meat fish oil gelatin humans can get infected even through the meat of the cow the buffalo and the milk products similarly the cow and sheep they interact some uh, they interact with each other they might spread the disease and then the sheep meat milk products can infect human being same thing if um, sheep and fish interact like sheep are fed fish oil for example right or um, milk replacer for example in many of the industrial farms the sheep babies and the cow babies don't get to uh, suckle their mother because their milk is directly taken and siphoned off for human consumption so the young link especially the female because the males are killed off the females they they are given uh, milk replacers so the and most of them come from fishes <laughs> these herbivores eat carnivorous food um 
and th that's how the prion can spread from can be transmitted from one body to another. Okay, so this is about prion. So we have talked about virus, we have talked about viroids, we have talked about prion. Now, dear students, I want to give an example of a viral disease that is currently rampant rampant in India as I record these lectures, August 2017. Okay, so earlier this year, um, H1N1 had been had started spreading in India, and if you look until May 717, we had some 8000 H1N1 cases in India, some 345 deaths in India. So this is in 2017 as I am recording this lecture, this is a flashback into 2009 when the swine flu, the H1N1 flu spread in North America, in South America and it caused up to uh, 94,000 cases there, some 500 deaths and made people, encouraged people to get flu vaccines every year. Now this is a reminiscence of that because India's um, infection rate is very high and I personally don't know the flu that I have right now is it H1N1 or not but if you notice that we notice that in especially in the deck in the southern part of the country we have quite high range of uh, number of cases and number of deaths. For example in Maharashtra we have a, an enormous amount of 181 deaths of 933 cases this is a very high mortality rate. This is 5%. So, one fifth of the people who were sick confirmed cases of H1N1 died. That's 20% mortality rate. So, now another thing to note is that as virus H1N1 transmits from one person to another, transports from one part of the country to another, one country to another country, it undergoes evolution. So, its mortality rate might also change. It's also possible that the mortality rate is different for different uh, states because the healthcare is different. Also, note that these are confirmed cases. So many unconfirmed cases that never go to me seek medical attention like my own case right now, they are not accounted for this in this. Now let us look at this infographic here, um, till July 9, so this is a little bit more recent, some 12,460 people were factored by H1N1 caused 600 deaths against 1,800 infections and 265 deaths in last year. So, this year we have nearly 8 times worse already, we are just above half the year gone in nearly 8 times worse H1N1 outbreak and the worst affected states are definitely Maharashtra with an extremely high mortality rate and now we see it is uh, less than 20 percent but nearly 30 percent, Telangana, Kerala, Rajasthan and Gujarat and we do not know how in next few months the disease will spread across. I believe it's already spreading in NCR and Delhi. We don't know, but um, if you look here, the worst epidemic we had of in past few years in 2013, there were some 5,000 cases of confirmed cases of H1N1 and some 700 deaths. In uh, 2014, that we had lesser number of H1N1 cases, but um, we had higher um, sorry and yeah high mortality in um, in um, 2015, we had some 42,000 uh, cases, confirmed cases of H1N1, which is a big number, and some uh, 3,000 people died. In 2016, we had a drop, so only 1,700 cases of confirmed cases of H1N1, but now it is increasing again. So, we do not know when we are going to have another major outbreak of H1N1. And even though it sounds like a public health problem, but this is also an environmental problem. So, for example, we do not know still the H1N1 virus, how long it persists on formites, on the surfaces. So, this is an environmental issue, how clean should we maintain our environment, how often should we wash our hands. Alrighty, and now how does H1N1 work? This is a very unique case because in H1N1 virus, especially a H1N1 virus, which is what we are facing right now, it is, uh, the virus has mutated and evolved in three different species in the birds, in the humans, in the pig. So first the bird flu and the human flu combined their genomes, the virus and they came up and they infested uh, pigs and then it evolved here and then it infected humans and now we have a really bad H1N1 issue. Alright dear students, I, this is all for today and this is all for the virus. In the next class we will pick up the first environmental microbiology problem and I will walk you through the problem how we apply the microbiological tools and understanding and how we solve it. Thank you.